the Medal of Honor. It's the highest and most prestigious level of military decoration awarded to U.S. soldiers for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty during battle. The medal was first issued to United States service members in 1862 during the Civil War and in every major military conflict since. For action during the U.S. involvement in World War II that lasted from 1941 to 45, upwards of 450 Medals of Honor were awarded, but it wasn't until more than 50 years after VE Day in 1997 that the names of Charles L. Thomas, Vernon J. Baker, Willie James Jr., Edward A. Carter Jr., George Watson, Reuben Rivers, and John Fox were added to that list of nearly 500 people. Why? Because these men were black. And in the still racially segregated American military of the early 1940s, it was Department of War policy to avoid having black soldiers in combat at all, and there was a silent pact to never allow any black soldiers to be recommended for a Medal of Honor, no matter how they performed. The new book, Immortal Valor, the Black Medal of Honor Winners of World War II, explores the wartime lives of Thomas, Baker, James, Carter, Watson, Rivers, and Fox that only came to light after a special 1993 commission combed the half-century-year-old records of the soldiers. And author, director, Robert Child combed through and researched the pre-conflict lives of the war heroes in his book to provide more context around the lives of these awardees. Only three of the seven men survived the war, but all of their stories will now live on forever. We talk with author Robert Child now about some of those lives and the times they lived in in the St. Louis County Library discussion, part of the virtual author series and celebration of Black History Month. Welcome to the virtual author series with the St. Louis County Library in partnership with HEC Media and Left Bank Books. Today, we are here with writer and director Robert Child, and we'll talk about his new book, Immortal Valor, the Black Congressional Medal of Honor winners from World War II. Thank you very much, Robert, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. This is, this is a history of the only seven Black soldiers that were eventually awarded the Medal of Honor in 1997 for their service uh, from World War II. Uh, can you talk about why there seems to be such a gap between when those awards were actually given to the soldiers um, you know, so far after the war? Yeah, it was uh, a combination of factors. Um, during the war, it was um, institutional racism in the military, and there was a unspoken rule that no black soldiers would be recommended for the uh, Medal of Honor. And that was only discovered years later when in the late 80s and early 90s, um, two senators from New York, whose names I don't recall, um, pushed the Pentagon, the Defense Department, to look into the reason why no Medal of Honor recipients were awarded the, the, the highest honor. And the Pentagon directed a study to be done at Shaw University, which looked into that, uh, and that began in 1993. And that was one of the things they discovered, the, the lead researcher, that there was an unspoken rule that no black soldiers would be submitted for the Medal of Honor. Now, was this codified in any sort of actual policy, or was this just a tacit uh, agreement among the people in charge? It was, uh, it was unspoken. The researcher, Dr. Gilbert, Gilbrand there said it was it was unspoken. He discovered how many Medal of Honor winners or awardees were actually given outside of the seven black uh, members of the military that you talk about in this book. For the Second World War, there's close to 500. I think there's just shy of 500, and um, so seven is is a very small percentage for African Americans in World War II. That's for sure. Did no one over the years question why there had been no awardees up until, say, 1992? I think that's when you mentioned when this study came about. The real catalyst for um, the ball starting to roll on awarding these medals was in the, up until the late 80s and early 90s, there were no black soldiers from World War I who were awarded the Medal of Honor either. 
And there was um, an investigator who looked into that and pressed the government and the army to re-examine um, the records and they came up with two soldiers from World War I at the time in the late 80s, early 90s. But the fact that the, these two men were awarded the medal from World War I got people thinking. They said, well, let's look into this. Why haven't any black soldiers from World War II been awarded the Medal of Honor either? So it was the absence of medals from World War I that really started the ball rolling. And why were these seven selected to, for further investigation? Well, the criteria at the study at Shaw University was um, set with precedent. And the precedent was that Eisenhower had uh, a couple cores of his, uh, under his command, re-examine Distinguished Service Cross recipients for elevation to the Medal of Honor. So this study took that as the criteria. They looked for um, black uh, Distinguished Service Cross recipients during World War II, and they made that the criteria. They found six initially, then they, they found another three. And the only anomaly was Reuben Rivers, who was awarded the Silver Star. And there, there are more deserving black soldiers from World War II who would, uh, you know, would be, could be recognized for it. Do you know how many? Uh, I know you're not, I'm not assuming that you're intimately involved in that, but you have taken time to compile this book. I don't know who are under consideration, but I do know that there are two that have online petitions that are trying to build up momentum for their recognition. And uh, I mention them in my book. One is Waverly Woodson, who served on a, as a medic on D-Day. And the second uh, gentleman is a sailor who served on the West Virginia during the Pearl Harbor attack. And that was Dory Miller. It's very interesting how you've laid out this book. You've taken the names and the stories of each of the seven men who were awarded the Medal of Honor, and you've broken down each of their stories really into three different parts. One, you talk about, I guess, their home life before they were involved in the military. Then you talk about the run-up to them actually joining into the war, and then some of the events that, uh, or, and the events that actually warrant them getting the Medal of Honor, and then you finish each one with uh, the actual decree for the Medal of Honor. How did you figure into going to that, using that method? Uh, to actually describe this. I knew how many words they wanted for the book, and I approached it scientifically, and I approached it almost in a, in a film way, because I looked at each man's story as a three-act story, just like a film, opening, middle, and close. And so I, that's what I did. I created three chapters out of each man's story. Uh, so it would be a journey. People would take a journey with this individual throughout the war and really live there, you know, alongside them. And um, I wanted to fe wanted it to feel like a movie, like we've we've gone into this movie and taken this journey, and we're almost out of breath at the end of the of you know this man's story. And then you turn the page, and wow, there's another story. You know, it's like, and then there's another story, and. I laid out the, the men, not chronologically, but um, I built up the men to the last story, which really takes your breath away. Um, when I always looked at these men, these seven men, because I knew who, of them, because I've done so much World War II material, films, and books, that I wasn't satisfied. It's like I didn't know these men. I, I couldn't get beyond their Medal of Honor citations, you know, which is basically their after action reports. I wanted to know these men. I wanted to bring them out as human beings and, and, and know their story. And that's why I set the bar very high because it's very difficult, you know, it was very difficult. Otherwise it would have been done years ago. Um, and that was my goal for the book. And there was a lot of research done through genealogy sites and um, speaking with the descendants, the families, um, working with the Congressional Medal, Medal of Honor Society and other Medal of Honor um, organizations. So it was a lot of research to, to 
pour into it so these stories do come to life. I think it's very interesting um, during this time. For me, I, I am not a member of the military, but my, I have members of the military, extensive members of the military, on my father and my mother's side of the family. I'm a black American. My father was born and grew up in outside of Memphis, Tennessee, like on the Mississippi border. Um, he went on, he eventually had a 20 year mil military career. He served on the USS Midway in between the Korean War and Vietnam. And there are, and I gave him the book. I actually, I let him read um, the advanced copy that I got. And he both loved this book and hated this book. <laughs> um, not because of you, he hated just seeing just the enormous amount of struggle that each one of these people had to go through that were even beyond what he had to go through. Again, he, he was on the ship for uh, four years after the Korean War, and he noted like things weren't as bad as that for him as a sailor when he was there, um, but just the, the out and out lies and just terrible equipment and everything that, that had to go, that all of these soldiers had to go through really made him upset. But again, he really appreciated, he appreciated your work and he appreciated learning more about that. But there were some memories that were brought up that were absolutely just not good. Well, that was one of the things that I point out to people is obviously there's still racism with us today, you know, prejudice, but what shocked me and upset me was looking back into this time at how pervasive it was. And black soldiers, when they went into town from 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 the army camps, they weren't allowed to look white civilians in the eye. That was the norm in the South. They, they had to look at the ground. And that was the way it was. And that's amazing to me. It just... It's amazing to you. It's not amazing to me. I mean, that's all part, part of family, not lore, but that's family reality from you know, my mom was raised in East Texas um, before she came up. My, uh, my father was born in 1940, and he, again, he grew up picking cotton, but eventually went on to the military as well, and he volunteered. Obviously, I don't have the perspective you do, but it still surpri surprised me and, and upset me because uh, a lot of people don't know that. You know, you know it, you, you know, through your family and growing up, but a lot of people don't know that's how it was. Mm -hmm. It's going to be almost impossible to spend an enormous amount of time talking about each of the seven soldiers. These are seven very different people. They, their backgrounds vary. Yes, they are all black, but you have educated people. You have people who are not educated. You have people who are engineers. You have people who were sharecroppers, people who came from farms a very different background of people. Some were from the South, but some were not from the South. And their experiences were all melded together. Um, and they are made one in the same by receiving that award, but these are very different men. Um, let's go ahead and talk about uh, the cover, the cover photo and, and that soldier. Yeah, the soldier on the cover is Sergeant Edward Carter. And he was born in Los Angeles, but his, his family moved to uh, Calcutta and then to Shanghai, Shanghai, China when he was very young. And what he did at age 15 is he joined the Chinese military, <laughs> the Chinese 19th Army, and fought against the Japanese invaders uh, on the line. And he was so brave and uh, so good that they wanted to elevate him to a lieutenant and uh, to fight under Chiang Kai-shek. And um, during these months that he was with the Chinese 19th Army, his family was frantic and his father finally found out that he was with the military and he went to uh, Eddie's commander and, and said, uh, you know, my, is my son here with, with the military? And his, the commander said, uh, yes, he's, he's performing very well and he's, we're about to, you know, elevate him to lieutenant. And he said, well, he's underage and he's coming back home with me. So <laughs> they were shocked. They, they, you know, he, he went back to, he attended Shanghai Military Academy and uh, then uh, a few years later, he um, there was a upper, uh, there was a, um, in North Africa, Abyssinia, the Italians decided to invade North Africa, and uh, Eddie went to the consulate in Shanghai and said, "I want to fight over in North Africa," and they told him that he couldn't do that because America wasn't involved with that war. So, 
So, so they said what we could do, because they knew he was determined, what we could do is, is you know, assign you to the Merchant Marines. And he, he took it, and he took it as a way to get away and start his adventure. And he joined the Merchant Marines in, you know, the late mid-30s, or, or late 30s, and uh, served there for about nine months, and returned to Los Angeles. And he was struck by the fact that when he got to Los Angeles, the country was in the midst of the Great Depression. There was no Great Depression in Shanghai because it was a cosmopolitan international city that just wasn't impacted by the Great Depression. So by, but when he went to Los Angeles, there was no work for black Americans in, during the Depression in Los Angeles. He, there simply wasn't. But you know, he, he did meet his wife there, Mildred, and he was still itching for adventure as he, as he considered it. And he read stories about the Spanish Civil War because there were a lot of pictorial spreads in Life magazine. And he decided to uh, use his merchant marine contacts and get over to Spain. And he ended up joining the fight uh, with the <laughs> Abraham Lincoln Brigade, which was unfortunately on the side of the communists, which he didn't really realize, but they were fighting Franco, the nationalists. And he fought with them bravely. He eventually left because the conflict ended in late 1939, early 1940, and he returned to the States. Again, 1940, his, uh, there was no work, and it was very tough to get a job, so he decided to rejoin the military. And he went to Fort Benning, and he uh, became part of a quartermaster corps which is a service uh, corps in the army, and he went over to Europe. But he kept petitioning uh, higher command for, for um, a combat role, and he kept getting denied until late 1944 when Eisenhower, after the Battle of the Bulge, put out a, a letter inviting black soldiers to serve on the front lines in combat. And uh, he, was, uh, he applied and was selected. And that's how he got into uh, serving with the 12th Armored Division in World War II. Again, speaking of indignities, and it, this is something that kind of runs through all, I think you mentioned in all seven, how all of the black soldiers were wanting to actually go fight. And they, were be, they felt like they were being held back, and they were being held back. They, they were being shuffled around. They weren't allowed to go and fight. And among other m myriad of indignities, I don't know how normal this is. I asked my father and he wasn't aware of it. But um, this soldier that we just mentioned, he had a higher rank. But in order to go fight, if I'm not mistaken, he had to reduce his rank to be able to go fight. Is that a typical thing in the military that, oh, we're going to go send you off, we're going to take your rank away for you to go do that? That, that to me, seemed almost more appalling than anything else. Is that, is that a normal practice? No, that's, that was only then. It was only in that situation. And he, he was a sergeant. He might have been a staff sergeant at the time at Fort Benning uh, in the quartermaster company. Uh, but they told him that if he did join the special training program that he'd have to um, be demoted in rank. And he, he didn't hesitate. He, he went back down to private and, and fought on the line. Um, I'd like to mention some other Medal of Honor recipients. Sure. His name is Vernon Baker, who stormed the castle position in Italy. He served in, in the company commander role of his company without being recognized for it. And, um, and he knew he would never be elevated to it. And before uh, they got into action in Italy, his company got a new white commander his white commander had never served in combat, had no combat. And uh, Vernon Baker had, had had experience already, you know, over the initial months. And his white commander, um, as, as soon as the Ger Germans started firing upon them when they were advancing on the castle position, he, he went and hid in a shed. And uh, Vernon, uh, the, the platoon leader, had to go back and find him and say, what are we going to do? And, and he said, um, you know, 
is everything under control? And Vernon said, yes, but you know, what, what should we do? He said, and his white commander said, well, I'm going to go back and get reinforcements. And what his white commander did was he went back, made his way back to headquarters down the mountain and told the um, regimental commander that Vernon's uh, platoon had been wiped out. So that meant that they would not send a, any reinforcements or any help to Vernon's platoon. So uh, that's what this uh, commander did. Uh, and what I was shocked about in that story, Vernon goes on to uh, himself to uh, um, take out several German bunkers and machine gun nests and mortar positions. And uh, he lost, um, he had 26 men in his uh, patrol, but he lost 19 of those men getting back down. He lost his medic, he lo you know, almost everyone. And he got back down the mountain, survived, and uh, eventually was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his action. But what was surprising to me is this white commander, his commander, who uh, retreated down the hill, was also awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his action in a very politically uh, maneuvered um, series of events. And this white commander claimed the actions that Vernon actually performed in his, in his petition for this award. And that just shocked me um, because he left them for dead uh, on the hill you know, against the Germans. So, you know, that makes you angry, that's for sure. Um, what uh, I had the um, pleasure of doing was actually seeing reading Vernon's book, plus Vernon Baker has three hours of recordings on the Library of Congress website, a Veterans History Project, that, that anyone can go and watch. And he's very emotional in this interview, very emotional, uh, talking about these instances and, uh, you know, what he went through. John Fox was from Ohio, um, outside Cincinnati, and uh, he attended um, Wilberforce University. He, he wanted to be a professional soldier. He t attended ROTC training and he became part of the 366th um, Infantry Regiment in Massachusetts, um, based in Ayer, Massachusetts. And he ended up uh, commanding a, a, a cannon company in that infantry unit and um, went over to Italy as part of the 92nd Division. and. Um, ended up becoming a forward observer uh, for his unit in a town called Soma Colonia, which was at the top of a certain section of mountains called the Ap Appiines uh, in Italy. And uh, he uh, served as a forward observer in a tower, a stone tower, I think 147 feet high, and uh, over Christmas 1944. And on the uh, last day of his um, assignment to that duty, um, his unit was attacked by Germans from two sides, uh, with artillery first in the morning around 4.30, and then the infantry came upon, uh, surrounded them. But he started calling in the artillery strikes on the Germans outside of the town, and um, he, he was very accurate because his commander called back and said, you got a mule train with our ammunition that was coming to help the Germans. We're getting reports that everything is going well, but still it didn't stop these uh, German soldiers. They were outnumbered three to one. And finally, the Germans uh, swarmed this town, and uh, he was hesitant because he didn't want to fire upon his own men, who ended up uh, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So finally got so um, hopeless that he radioed into fire direction control and said, uh, um, you've got to fire on my position, and, and he gave them coordinates, and they refused. They said, we can't do that, and, you know, we can't do that. He said, you, ha you have to do that. So they sent it up to higher command to, to, to see if they would approve it, and they did. And uh, higher command said yes, and then they said, we're going to do this. Are you sure, John? And, and he said, I'm sure. There's more of us, more of them than there are of us. So he gave them the coordinates, 
And as an artillery observer, what you do is you call in coordinates and then you adjust. So he called in the coordinates for a salvo that landed 60 feet away, or 60 yards away. So he had to, he had to say, no, it's not, <laughs> not close enough. You gotta bring it in closer. <laughs> they sh shot the salvo again, and, uh, and it, was, it, it rung the tower, and he said, yeah, that's it. Fire, you know, he made the call fire for effect, so uh, they adjusted and uh, they fired on his position and he was killed. Uh, but a lot of Germans were taken out, the enemy was taken out with him at the same time. And um, his body was recovered um, and uh, he, um, it, it was uh, very heart-wrenching because his good friend in the unit, who he called into to uh, fire up upon his position. And that uh, soldier, Otis Zachary, was very broken up for the rest of his life that he had to do that. Um, he was very emotional over that. Um, but John was, um, didn't, wasn't recognized right away for that action. You know, again, there was a delay in recognizing him for even receiving the Distinguished Service Cross. Um, because the uh, commander of the 92nd Division, uh, General Ned Allman, was an avowed racist. And uh, that's been written down, that's not my opinion. Uh, that's, that's in the record. Uh, so he was delayed his uh, Distinguished Service Cross till 1982, until it was finally looked into, and, uh, and a gentleman petitioned the Army to open up the case, and they did finally award that uh, second highest medal to his widow, Arlene Fox, which in the study at Shaw University was elevated to the Medal of Honor. But um, an incredible story of uh, bravery um, in, uh, in the face of overwhelming odds. Why did you take up this cause? There, as you mentioned, no one else had written this book, no one had compiled it, and this had not been, this hadn't been talked about really since 1997 when Bill Clinton actually put this into place. And given the way that maybe the political and just general climate is going on here in the United States at this point, people would say, oh, you're, this is a divisive book. You're trying to talk about how racist the military was. We should all be coming together. How did you decide to take on this subject right now? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question. I, uh, it, it isn't connected to the political situation in the country or George Floyd or anything like that. That, that wasn't a catalyst. Um, I, uh, I felt a strong call to do this book because of my earlier book, The Lost Eleven. And I felt like these men's stories, I was unsatisfied with what I knew about these men. I, I felt like they deserved um, They'd, they'd been awarded the Medal of Honor, yes, in 1997, but I didn't know them, you know? It's like, why? There was, a, there, was there citations that you could look up on Wiki Wikipedia, but I wanted to know who they were, you know? How did they accomplish this? How did they grow up? What, what did they do to finally do this? What example could they show? Uh, do you think that you could use the other medium that you're accustomed to working in film to turn this book into a film? Uh, I have no doubt, um, but my name isn't big enough to, <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to do that with uh, uh, Netflix. What I would uh, hope would happen is um, a producer connected to a studio would read this book and say, I've got to do this. You know, someone who's connected to, uh, you know, uh, at that level, be able to produce it, you know, contact us and, and say, we want to option the book, we want to do these stories. And of course, I'd be part of that. Well, Robert Child, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today at the St. Louis County Library Virtual Author Series and part of Black History Month to talk about your book, Immortal Valor, the Black Medal of Honor winners of World War II. My father thanks you for your presentation uh, with the book. He does not read a ton of books in general um, outside of audiobooks, but he ate this book up 
and he greatly appreciated your work that was put in there and helped to get these stories to light. And maybe we can look forward to a visual presentation of this as well in the future. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.